I'd been interested in large social animals for a long, long time because um, we had found that humpback whales sing long, complicated songs. And I'd been, for a number of years, helping to record them at sea and discovering that their songs were continuously changing, evidence of complex mind, a more complex social system than people perhaps had suspected for these animals. So what do you think of on land? What do you think of when you uh, would like to be able to see the animal that you're recording? Elephants, of course. Um, and with my old friend, Bill Langbauer, we had been thinking about uh, what elephants in captivity, particularly in India, and their mahouts must know about each other. After all, they lived together all their lives. And I wondered whether there might be some way that we could find out how elephants think and what their communication system is like. So I went to a zoo, uh, actually at the tail end of a symposium about whales out in California. Uh, and in the zoo, I had permission to sit next to the elephant cage for a week. Uh, that's exactly what I did, um, and saw little bits of evidence of the wonderful things that you hear about from the field research in Kenya. A large, uh, highly coordinated uh, social groups in which some animals were more interested in others than in some others. But I didn't uh, hear anything that I thought was uh, evidence of, of anything that people didn't already know. But I happened to f notice after some days that every now and then I was feeling a throbbing in the air, kind of a pulsation in my ears, sort of the feeling you get if the windows are rolled down wrong in your car. And it occurred to me that this might be sound below the frequencies that I, as a human being, could hear. And eventually, that it might be made by the elephants. And they might be communicating with each other in ways folks didn't know about. So, sound. Maybe this was sound, maybe not. Uh, but I came back to Cornell, where I had just uh, started working at the Lab of Ornithology uh, in what would later become the Bioacoustics Research Program. Uh, and talked to uh, Carl Hopkins and Bob Kapranica, both acoustic biologists in neurobiology and behavior. And they said, oh my goodness, uh, we aren't listening to that part of the acoustic spectrum. Take our equipment, go back to the zoo, take your old friend Bill, and see, if, see, what, see what you come up with. So for a month, uh, we recorded Bill and uh, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas and I recorded almost continually in the same uh, zoo environment that had 11 uh, elephants and kept track of all the behavior that we could see as well. And what happened was that uh, nothing. We didn't hear very much, but every now and then we would feel a pulsation. When I came back at the end of the month, I didn't think we had anything. When it saw Carl, we played back one of these sessions when the old female, who was acting like a matriarch, had then walked to the end of the 90-foot cage, um, flapping her ears loudly, blowing out loudly, and we had felt the throbbing in the air. Liz had run outdoors to see what the male, who was in the breeding condition called must, was doing. He had a huge sand yard. He was very irritable. He was throwing stuff at tourists. But on this occasion, he had come right up to the outside of the same wall that the female was on the inside of. And they were only two feet apart from each other through a thick slab of concrete. And lo and behold, when with Carl, we sped up the tape that I had recorded, that it sounded like nothing except the flapping of the ears. Now the ears were like this, and in between we heard uh, 
Rawr. The voices of two animals, now two and a half octaves higher than what they had been when we recorded them. This is the female. That's the male. Female, male, female, male, female, and the male underneath. Well, it was it was a discovery, of course, that was interesting because um, we couldn't hear what the elephants could hear. But it was also interesting because very low frequency sound travels much better than higher sounds. And so this might be the uh, basis of a long distance communication system. And there had been a mystery in the recordings, uh, uh, always visual records of um, elephant behavior in Amboseli, um, made by Cynthia Moss, Joyce Poole, Ian Douglas Hamilton. Ian said, maybe there's ESP. Because again and again, these researchers had discovered that an elephant at a great distance seemed to know what another elephant two miles away was doing. The males who lived separately from the females were able to find the females during the tiny window of four or five days out of four or five years when the female is in breeding condition. The males would come. The females lived in uh, groups that were coordinated with each other on many levels. There were some groups that were very close. Those are obviously genetically related. Old sisters would be the leaders of those groups. But there were other groups that seemed to behave like friends. We didn't know at the time how they were related. And they, rather than staying together all the time, would forage separately at distances that could be reached if you were using infrasound and could not by any other means people knew about. So we went to Africa. I went to Africa first to work with Joyce Poole, who was beginning to study acoustic communication in a population of elephants she and Cynthia Moss knew very well as individuals. And there we did verify each of these hunches that the males were probably using female calls, which were quite loud, uh, to find the females in breeding condition. And that uh, there was all kinds of uh, communication that seemed to be linking up females in groups and in related or friendly groups. Look at who, who are elephants anyway. I mean, we had a sense already that they were immensely complicated that their societies were maybe, you know, touching on what we know as human beings with all kinds of relationships, friendly, unfriendly, uh, suspicious, um, and, uh, and desirous. And so it was, it, it, this seemed as though it might link all these many, many observations that people had been making over the years. But then we still, we didn't know that it was, that all this was happening. And Bill Langbauer, who had trained in zoo uh, experimental work, um, took us back. We went back to, not to uh, Kenya, but to Etosha Park in Namibia. And there we did a series of experiments where we played back from a huge loudspeaker uh, calls made by elephants whose original volume we knew, um, two uh, elephants um, a kilometer and two kilometers away. And we were looking out for particular behaviors. Were these elephants that we were watching from the top of a tower down at a water hole, would they suddenly freeze? Would they lift their ears? Would they tighten them like this, as if something was going on that they needed to listen to? Would they swing their heads from side to side? And if it was a female group, would the comp composition of the group change? Would they form a dense cluster? We found that all of these things happened, even from the uh, calls that we played from two kilometers away. Um, 
And because we were only playing those plays calls at half volume, uh, then we extrapolated that probably elephants could hear each other's calls considerably farther than uh, two kilometers. Well, then it became very interesting to know whether the environment was playing a role in the transmission of these calls. And a, a couple of atmospheric scientists from uh, uh, University of Virginia, Mike Garstang and, my, and David Larum, did an experiment in Itasha Park where they established that there is every evening and throughout the night a so-called temperature inversion. That is to say, cold air has come in just before sunset and made a layer and then the warm air has risen and formed a kind of a ceiling. Well, that layer of cold air produces a duct through which low frequency sound travels extremely well. It's even enhanced. Uh, and uh, the, these guys taking the measurements we had made of the uh, original volume of the calls the elephants were making found out that when the temperature inversion is, is really there about 80% of the time in the savannah, um, the, these calls which we had measured uh, carrying at least two kilometers, at least causing behavioral changes over those distances, these calls could maybe go as much as 10 kilometers at the very best. Uh, and um, isn't that fascinating? And this all feeds in with all kinds of anecdotes about elephants in one place, knowing that a call is occurring many miles away and so forth. So it begins to inform us about what their perceptual world is like.